Okay, I think that we will get started. Um, so first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ellen Lautenberg, um, a member of the Exposomics and Children's Environmental Health Board at Mount Sinai. I would like to uh, welcome you all to today's presentation. And uh, before we get to Dr. Hadley, uh, I'm just gonna give a very brief introduction. Um, this is the second session of this year's lunchtime chats with one of Mount Sinai's world-class environmental mix medicine experts. I don't wanna to take too much time away from him, um, but just uh, give a very brief introduction um, to say that each week during this series, we will focus on a different aspect of how the environment plays a role in determining our health and well being. This showcases the latest cutting edge research that we aim to provide um, some insight and actionable day to day tools to make better health decisions for ourselves and our families. I have personally been involved in a volunteer capacity at Mount Sinai since 2010 and have witnessed firsthand the transformation of the environmental health research program. Mount Sinai continues to attract some of the brightest scientists in this field, and our institute offers a multidisciplinary approach to research, education, and clinical care. What is particularly exciting to me is the innovative methods that are being developed today uh, and how they increase the speed of scientific discovery and therefore the possibilities for disease prevention. Today, we'll be talking about matters of the heart, literally. Our scientists at the Institute of Exposomics Research are true innovators, uncovering new insights that deepen our understanding of the complex relationship between all things in our environment and health outcomes. As we mark American Heart Month in February, it's worth highlighting that cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of death globally and in the US, accounting for millions of deaths each year, with a significant portion of these deaths attributed to environmental factors. Exposure to air pollutants, such as particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, have been linked to a range of cardiovascular diseases, including heart attacks, stroke, and arrhythmias. Today, we will delve into the latest research on this important topic, exploring the mechanisms by which air pollution damages heart health and discuss the potential implications for the health of future generations. We know that the climate crisis has led to a health crisis with patients grappling with extreme heat, extreme weather events, and the health effects of increased air pollution. The presentation will be about 25 minutes, followed by uh, 20 minutes for audience questions. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function. And if we can't get to them all, we will make sure that they get answered and shared on social media and perhaps in other ways. Dr. Hadley is a clinical cardiologist and environmental health researcher. He earned his medical degree and master's in public health at Harvard University and completed his clinical training at Mount Sinai, where he currently holds a joint appointment as assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, as well as environmental medicine and public health. Additionally, he serves as the United States representative to the World Heart Federation Air Pollution Expert Group. Dr. Hadley's research focuses on the cardiovascular effects of environmental exposures. He holds leadership roles in multiple nationally funded studies investigating the health impacts of air pollution in Iran, India, and the United States. With years of experience, both in clinical practice and in-depth research, Dr. Hadley is a true expert in this field, offering a unique perspective and valuable insights on the impact of the environment on heart, heart health. So with that, uh, Dr. Hadley, please take it away. Hi, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me. Thanks so much for the warm introduction and the invitation to uh, speak to all of you. Let me get my slides up here. There we go. Let me let me know if you can't see anything, but I'm going to get started. 
I'm going to try and cover um, a lot of ground uh, in just a few minutes here. I've been asked to focus on the uh, impact of air pollution on cardiovascular health. And uh, I'll begin with a discussion of the magnitude of this global problem and then specific air pollutants that lead to heart disease. And at the end, um, hopefully try to link this back to the practice of medicine and what we can offer our patients to help protect themselves from air pollution. So in terms of um, financial disclosures, I'm a consultant for the World Health Organization on this topic, and a few of my slides come from my work with them. Um, so let's just start off with um, why this topic matters, the global burden of disease. So some numbers, so air pollution exposures right now are estimated to be responsible for about 7 million deaths worldwide, and the majority of those are from heart disease. Uh, about 7 billion people are exposed to levels of air pollution above levels recommended by the World Health Organization, um, and that's approximately 90% of the global population. And then overall, that makes air pollution the number four risk factor for global mortality. So you have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and then air pollution, and then smoking. Um, and air pollution is on the rise. And uh, these deaths due to air pollution are expected to double um, by 2050. And in developing countries, that's due largely to this rapid industrialization um, and burning of fossil fuels. So in the, in the United States, exposures are, are rising rapidly as well, uh, more due to uh, wildfires driven by climate change, particularly on the West Coast, as you've seen in the news. Here's a, a comparison between air pollution and some other commonly discussed threats to global health. We talk about all the time, and you can see how right now air pollution is eclipsing AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined, um, as well as some other risk factors for mortality. Here's a, a pie chart showing the top five causes of death attributed to air pollution. Um, and this maybe is a bit counterintuitive, I think people find, um, because you know, we inhale air pollution into the lungs. So uh, we think it's gonna be lung disease is the main problem, um, but it's not actually the case. It's number two. Number one is cardiovascular disease, particularly heart attacks in, in, uh, in red there and stroke in orange. And we'll talk about the mechanisms for these um, in a minute. And when you dive deeper into cardiovascular mortality specifically, not just overall mortality, um, we can see these numbers. Uh, so globally, there's uh, about three and a half million cardiovascular deaths. That's one in five, which have been now attributed to air pollution. Um, when you look at severely polluted regions like India and China, it's even higher, maybe as high as one in three cardiovascular deaths. And then in the USA, rates are lower, not surprisingly, because we have lower exposure levels where maybe one in 25 cardiovascular deaths are attributable to air pollution. Here in New York, uh, about 1,300 people die annually from cardiovascular disease attributed to air pollution. That's about one in 40 of our cardiovascular deaths. So for a comparison, um, a similar number of deaths in New York are due to aortic stenosis, which is like a, a tight heart valve. And that's a problem that we've recently invested just enormous resources in solving something of the same scale. Let's talk about where air pollution comes from um, and how it leads to uh, cardiovascular disease. So in the United States, there's a few key sources we got to focus on depending on what region you're in. So in big cities like ours, uh, the major source of air pollution is vehicular emissions, so exhaust and brake and, and tire wear. Um, here's a map, this is, was also on the title slide, that we developed published in circulation showing how heart attack risk varies based on um, residents in New York City and, and the, uh, the air pollution levels at that, at that location. And you can see that the risk is higher in higher density regions where there's more traffic, um, and there's less circulation through the street canyons, um, and also near um, major roadways like I-95, which you can see snaking through the Bronx there to the north. Um, in non-urban settings in the US, uh, other sources are more dominant. So if you look at industrial regions like the Rust Belt, then major emissions come from coal plants, from smelting, manufacturing. Uh, in more rural regions, like in, in Appalachia, for example, indoor burning of solid fuels for cooking and heating is a major source of exposure. And then outside of the United States, particularly in Africa and South Asia, this indoor burning of, of solid fuels is also very pervasive, very intense, estimated to be responsible for about one third of the global cardiovascular deaths due to air pollution. And then lastly, you know, across the US, the fastest growing source is wildfire smoke. And I just wanna emphasize the gravity of this wildfire smoke problem, which really is growing worse every year due to climate change. And as you've seen, 
um, in the news. There are fires, you know, here in North America, but also decimating Brazil, Australia, Central Africa. This is a satellite image of the American West in the Pacific during the 2020 fires. So you can see this dense smoke covering an area the size of Western Europe. Um, it's an area inhabited by tens of millions of people. Smoke from these fires, you might recall, was detected here in New York in 2020 and in 2021. You could smell it in the air for a few days. It darkened the skies a little bit. It turned the sun red. Um, and this is a scale and intensity of air pollution exposures that we've never seen before in our nation's history on the East Coast. Um, and we expect it to only get worse and, and more frequent. This, this, these exposures can travel thousands of miles across national borders, across oceans. This map shows the expected change in what's called the KB drought index, which is kind of the main predictor of wildfire risk. Um, and so in the United States, we've seen about a five-fold increase in annual areas burned since the 70s. And by this model, um, we're ex ex expecting about 80 million Americans to be exposed to wildfire smoke annually by 2050. Um, let's talk, uh, let's just shift gears here. Those are the main sources. Let's talk about the components of air pollution. Um, you know, what, what are the specific components we have to worry about? Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of air pollutants. Um, the main ones we think about are particulate matter or PM. There's also these volatile organic carbon uh, compounds black carbon, gases like ozone, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide. Today, I'm really gonna just hone in on particulate matter because that's the pollutant with by far the strongest associations with cardiovascular disease. So particulate matter um, are these microscopic particles of solid or sometimes liquid matter. Um, it's usually a combination of elemental carbon and sulfate and nitrite and complex organic molecules. And we classify it into different um, categories based on size, based on what size filter it could pass through. So PM 2.5, which is uh, circled down there, is something is, is a level of particle that could pass through a filter that's 2.5 microns in size. And incidentally, that's the same size as a red blood cell. So that's the same size as a particle that could uh, complete a, a circulatory loop through the cardiovascular system through a capillary. Um, and it's it's this exposure to this PM 2.5 that really has the strongest associations with cardiovascular disease. So just to kind of orient ourselves um, to different levels of exposure. Uh, so these are in, in micrograms per cubic meter, which is just how we usually me we measure this stuff in the air. So across the entire US, we're at about a nine. Um, that's below the WHO recommendation for average annual exposure of 10. New York City, we're a little above that at about 12. Um, when you look at the uh, recommended daily exposure, that's 20. When you look at the average exposure across all of Asia and its 4 billion inhabitants, that's already at 35. Um, when you look at the most polluted cities on earth, like New Delhi or Dhaka, these have average um, annual exposures of about 225, but similar to smoking a few cigarettes every day for, for every one of the 20 million inhabitants of New Delhi. And then when you look at these wildfire events, when they're peaking um, in Portland, Oregon, for example, the average exposure for all of September 2020 was 250, so even higher than those cities um, in Asia. Uh, indoor smoking, uh, smoke burning can be even higher because there's, if there's limited ventilation, you can be up at a 300 or even up to um, 30,000 is kind of the maximum level that's been, that's been recorded. And that's around the range of really active smoking, like literally uh, drying in on a cigarette. You might be more familiar with this metric. This is the United States Air Quality Index, which tries to simplify air pollution exposures into these different color-coded categories. Um, they assign uh, numbers to different PM 2.5 levels. So you can see like a good AQI in green is given a number between um, zero and 50 here, which corresponds to PM 2.5 levels below 12. Um, which is where we are in New York City. And then an unhealthy AQI in red um, is given a number of 151 to 200, corresponds to a level of 56 to 150. I kind of wish they just stuck with PM 2.5 concentrations instead of creating the separate scale, um, but it is what it is. Um, so, you know, you can see average exposures across Asia, like we discussed, would be kind of um, on the border here between yellow and orange. You know, in the West Coast, uh, during peak fire season, we're down in that light purple color. Um, this is another map of global exposures. You can see how it varies, usually highest in, um, in these countries in uh, Southern and Eastern Asia. Some high exposures across the Sahara and the Taklamakan Desert and the Arabian Peninsula, and that's just um, from, from dust storms, which 
may impact health, but the, the evidence is more limited. Here's a close up on exposures in the United States. You can see in Los Angeles, um, in the uh, Rust Belt, um, we're getting higher concentrations. It's another figure that um, shows exposures uh, relative to the population of different countries. You can see that that vertical dotted line AQG of 10, that's that WHO recommendation for annual exposures. And you can see how the vast majority of the global population is far above that USA kind of straddles the line. Okay, so um, at this point, you know, we've covered, I think the global burden, I hope I've convinced you that it's uh, pretty significant. I want to kind of change gears and talk more about how air pollution affects cardiovascular health. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a researcher, so I could, I could go on about the, the, the studies published, but I think that's getting too much in the weeds. I just want to show this one study. This is the Harvard Six uh, City Study, which is the watershed paper in our field. Um, and uh, back in 1993, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So they looked at six different cities. They followed uh, patients in those cities um, uh, 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 and monitored their air pollution exposures and looked for cardiovascular outcomes, controlling for a lot of different factors. And they showed a clear association here that you can see a linear relationship between PM 2.5 exposure and mortality for each of these cities from P for Portage, Wisconsin, there in the lower left of the graph, all the way up to S for Steubenville, Ohio, using our 1990s graphical uh, rendering systems. And then uh, extended follow-up uh, of this cohort has now gone on for 35 years, and we've seen clear relationships between uh, particulate matter exposures and cardiovascular mortality and, and, and different types of mortality, heart failure, stroke, um, heart attack, et cetera. And since then, there's been numerous other large, really well-designed prospective cohort studies. Don't have time to go through these in detail, but um, they've really fleshed out our understanding of the relationship between exposures and all these different cardiovascular diseases. Here at Mount Sinai, I'll just plug that we've kind of thrown our hat in the ring with a cohort of our own. This is the space study. This is an NIH-funded project looking at the impact of eight different environmental risk factors, including air pollution um, on cardiovascular events. And it's in this really well-characterized cohort of 50,000 individuals that have been followed for over 10 years now in Iran. And we're, we're starting to see already this, um, this relationship again between air pollution exposures and cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about this study in particular because it's a true exposomic study. We're really looking at multiple environmental risk factors simultaneously and, and looking at how they interact with each other um, to produce healthier disease. And uh, as all this evidence has mounted, um, the you know, national boards, the American Heart Association, et cetera, have started coming out with these consensus documents um, that you know, uh, agree that there is this causal and, and modifiable relationship between air pollution exposure and cardiovascular health. So uh, uh, at this point, everyone believes it. Um, you know, the jury's not out anymore. And the, the uh, European Society of Cardiology followed suit uh, in 2015 as well. So let's talk about how this happens. How does air pollution cause heart disease? Um, it's a pretty uh, big topic, um, but I think it was nicely summarized by this recent paper in the New England Journal. So first, air pollution is inhaled and it can act on the lungs and then also enter the systemic circulation, um, which results in this cascade of, of inflammation. So if you have chronic exposure to air pollution like this, um, then you get the development of traditional cardiovascular risk factors, things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and ultimately the development of atherosclerosis of plaques in the walls of your arteries, and potentially also scarring of the heart muscle itself. So in this illustration here, you can kind of see the cross-section of that artery developing more and more plaque uh, with more and more air pollution exposure. And then ultimately that plaque can rupture and occlude the artery. So, and if that happens in blood vessels that supply the brain, we call that a stroke. If that happens in the blood vessels that supply the heart, we call that a heart attack. And uh, heart attacks and heart inflammation like this can also cause this scarring of the heart and ultimately a weak pump um, and heart failure. And long-term exposures, there's sort of a, a long-term short-term dichotomy as well. So long-term exposures can lead to this development of atherosclerosis. Um, but short-term exposures can lead to plaque rupture and uh, go from that thick plaque to an actual cardiac event like a heart attack. Um, and this is why people who have atherosclerosis for other reasons, like chronic uncontrolled diabetes, you know, may have a cardiac event just with their first air pollution exposure because that air pollution is sort of, we say, harvesting um, 
the, the pre-existing plaque. Uh, so currently data suggests that um, the risk of these different cardiac events increases about one to 2% for short-term exposures above baseline, about five to 10% for people who are chronically exposed to, um, to, to PM 2.5. And that's per 10 micrograms uh, per meter cubed. So it increases the higher the exposure is. Uh, also at Mount Sinai, we've thrown our hat in to uh, this fibrosis pathway. We're, we're, we're looking at uh, 1,100 patients who've had cardiac MRIs, looking at where they live and the exposures that they've had in that area and to see if we can find the signature of air pollution on the heart. Um, that's it's early work on that, but very excited about it. Okay, so um, kind of trying to bring this home, let's talk about what we can do. Um, about these exposures? How can we protect patients? This is the topic I really care a lot about. How can we bring exposomics into clinical care? Right now, I think there's still kind of two barriers to doing this. Um, there's the risk assessment barrier and there's the, um, the intervention barrier. So risk assessment, doctors have to be able to identify the patients that are at risk. And then once we've found the patients that are at risk, we need to have evidence-based interventions that, that we can provide. In terms of risk assessment, um, I don't think this is as foreign as we think. We already talk about, um, you know, smoking, diet, et cetera, other environmental factors. So it's pretty easy, I think, to start asking about air pollution exposures. This is a questionnaire that we developed that's currently being validated in Ghana um, for looking at screening for air pollution exposures in, in low-income countries. And then we can also develop these risk assessment maps like this, which can tell us about what levels of exposure patients are having based on their home address. And uh, you know, an exciting area is, is, the, is how this is moving into personalized medicine. So this isn't an endorsement for any of these products, but just to give you a sense of what's out there. So Apple Watch, for example, can, can link to these exposure maps and give people a real-time estimate of the air pollution levels around them. And these are really popular applications. Like you can see this air quality visual map has like 182,000 positive reviews, if you believe it. Um, and a lot of these apps are also trying to provide education on the risks associated with air pollution and sometimes in misleading ways. And it's going to get even more personalized than this because we're, we're also getting sensors that are detecting the air around you rather than linking to a map. They're detecting the air in your immediate environment uh, and telling you what your exposure is. And certain uh, telecommunications companies have patents for this kind of device. Uh, they're not ready for prime time yet, but I, I don't think it's going to be long until you start seeing these kinds of things integrated into your personal electronic devices. And that has implications for doctors, of course, um, because, um, you know, we'll have patients coming and talking about what they've seen on their iPhone and wanting the doctor to tell them what they can do about it. Um, and, you know, and once we know these exposure levels, we can estimate the risk for different patients. Um, I think this is something we're going to start bringing into the electronic medical record. This is something we're doing at Mount Sinai. Um, this is just a pilot image, but the idea here is that the doctor can pull up the patient's home address, plug it into a map, which tells you about all the local environmental risks and help you manage that in real time. Anything we can do to decrease these barriers to make it easier to talk about the environment is gonna help clinical care. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there. I know we're probably talking about interventions a little bit in the, um, in the question and answer section. So um, I'll turn it back over. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hadley. Um, and I, um, before we get started with the Q&A, we do have some questions that have come in. Um, I wanted to invite the audience to learn a little bit more about how the environment impacts our health by visiting the website. Um, at Mount Sinai exposomics.org. And there is a slide there um, for you to, to take a look at um, in the case that uh, you want to explore a little bit more. Um, and if you have any questions, concerns in your own communities, um, questions about pesticide use in public parks or access to healthy foods, clean water, um, the scientists from Sinai are available to speak and provide some data that underpin sound policies that promote healthy environments. So please um, contact us uh, regarding any of those kinds of questions, or if you're interested in um, having someone come into your community to discuss this. Um, and um, finally, if you want to get more involved, 
We are seeking nominations for the Mount Sinai Exposomics and Children's Environmental Health Board, a group that supports the work of the Institute. So please feel free to contact us about that. Um, okay, so getting to questions, I know that um, Dr. Hadley really just uh, showed us a slide about um, where you get disparities uh, sometimes in neighborhoods and areas um, such as, you know, lower income, that kind of thing. And uh, there happens to be a question asking about um, how do you sort of look at that and, and look to prevent these kinds of inequities in um, air pollution exposure uh, that are experienced by, you know, some of these communities? Um, you know, how would you characterize that? And, yeah, that's a that's a great point, point. Um, and that's something we see in the U.S., but you know, also globally, where often it's the most marginalized, you know, socioeconomically disadvantaged minority communities that are suffering the greatest person burden of air pollution. And there's some historic reasons for that. And you look at redlining, for example, and the co-location of like industry and factories with some lower income neighborhoods. So there's a lot of historic precedent. So, uh, and then you compound that by the fact that oftentimes those disadvantaged groups already have poorer health to begin with and may not have the resources to protect themselves to you know to get an air purifier face mask other interventions we can talk about um, to protect themselves from air pollution so all of that definitely compounds so I think that um, places pressure on the health, public health care system to focus on those most you know vulnerable groups and to really direct the majority of the resources towards improving their health both raising the floor of cardiovascular health in general, and then providing more targeted interventions. Those interventions can come both at the, in the individual level um, in terms of reducing you know, individual exposures, but also in terms of helping with you know, regulation, for example, to lower, to lower emissions that affect those populations. Okay, great, thank you for that. I apologize, but I, of course, today I happen to have wood chipping going on outside my window. So I might move if it's uh, if it continues. Um, but um, second question: um, Is there any uh, research that shows differences in air quality for somebody who lives in cities who live at different heights, like an apartment on the first floor versus you know high up? I suppose you know how often you open your windows and all of that. That's a great question. Um, so they, you know, New York actually, uh, the New York City government has a set of hundreds of sensors all located all over the city that they use to create their map. Most of them, but not all of them are at street level. And you do see variations with elevation. Um, typically there's slightly higher levels as you would probably expect lower down. Um, uh, and it gets a little bit better higher up, but it's not, it's not significant. I kind of take, I'd probably, and it, and it varies minute to minute. So I think it, it's better to kind of look at the, you know, go on the EPA website, look at the US um, AQI to get a sense of kind of what the average level is in New York, because that's probably any closer to what your average exposure is. It's really hard to say for any one apartment um, what your level is. Okay. Um, so also, um, these, so uh, one of the audience members is asking whether masking helps to reduce exposures. Yeah, so um, this is kind of where the field is right now is testing all of these different interventions to see if they reduce cardiovascular events. As a generalization, we know that interventions like reducing exposure in mice saves the lives of mice. We haven't proven it definitively in all cases for heart disease. What we have shown is these mechanistic links where if you put on a face mask, you maybe reduce inflammatory markers in your blood, or you, re you reduce um, your systolic blood pressure a few points, for example. We don't have the long-term data to show that that translates into a, a, a benefit. So there's a lot of really exciting randomized trials going on to give us those results. So with that caveat, I will say we don't have the same level of evidence to recommend a face mask as we would for like a statin to lower your cholesterol, but I think we're gonna get there. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, the, the current evidence supports the use of a face mask if 
you're a highly susceptible person, meaning you already have pre-existing cardiovascular disease, particularly atherosclerosis, and if you're exposed to high levels um, of air pollution. So if you're someone who has pre-existing heart disease and you're in a wildfire event, or um, you know, you're spending a long time on I-95 and a two-hour commute with the wind in a convertible, those kinds of things, um, I would personally recommend um, a face mask. Okay, and that sort of leads into another question that uh, somebody's asking, which is how one can improve the air quality within their homes. Great. So um, there's uh, a few different ways to, to think about this. One is um, you know preventing bad air from getting in, and then the other is cleaning the air that's already in there. So um, if you're in an area with, with high air pollution, this is more true, and you're seeing this already in the West Coast, you need to think about sealing the building envelope, um, you know, preventing leaks through doors and windows, keeping those doors and windows closed when levels are high. And then um, ideally have a clean air space in your house, like one or two designated rooms where you tend to spend a lot of time, like, the, like a bedroom, um, where you can put a portable air cleaner. And those have been shown to significantly reduce air pollution levels indoors and have translated into these kind of preclinical uh, cardiovascular benefits. If, you, if you're in a building with um, an HVAC system, mechanical ventilation, just make sure that there's a, a high arrestance particulate filter, like a really fine filter that's you know, cleaned and changed regularly um, to filter out air pollution for the whole building. That's something that we focus a lot on hospitals. Okay, um, so um, in terms of, um, you know, looking at uh, multiple environmental, environmental exposures together over the course of a lifetime, for example, using different types of data, NASA satellites, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Can you talk about how this research in exposomics will help us to make inroads into uh, cardiovascular disease prevention. Sure, so yeah, um, you know, air pollution is just one of many environmental risk factors for heart disease. And we're studying a lot of them here at the Exposomics Institute. Um, and, um, you know, there's growing evidence for other risks, for example, things that disturb your sleep, like light at night, for example, um, or temperature, um, chronic loud noise exposure, which is something we deal with in ICUs, uh, dietary exposures, overnutrition, exposure to metals like lead and mercury, et cetera. All of these things drive this common pathway of inflammation and, and cardiometabolic disease. Um, and climate change is just gonna exacerbate this and make it even more complicated. So we're gonna see heavier precipitation and runoff which increases contamination of our water and food supplies with heavy metals. We're seeing a loss of biodiversity and loss of traditional diets across the world, leading to the adoption of these, you know, really high caloric imported foods. Um, we're seeing extreme weather events causing mass migration, disrupting access to care. Hospitals are getting overwhelmed by emergency services and don't have the capacity to um, care for chronic diseases like heart disease. So, you know, with climate change, the environment is really moving, I think, front and center into, you know, really becoming the, the major public health issue of this century. And ex exposomics really helps us understand that, helps us understand who is at risk and how to help. Um, you mentioned the NASA satellites. That's one way we can look at some of these environmental risk factors. But we're also, you know, here and elsewhere developing new methodologies, new statistics to kind of unpack these extremely complicated causal networks that connect the environment to the disease, understand what's causing what, what's confounding what relationship, um, and understand what the key pressure points really are to intervene. So I think it's an exciting time. Okay, great. So um, the next two questions, um, I'm gonna put them out there together because they're just maybe, maybe related, but um, so somebody was asking about Gas stoves have recently been in the news. Um, so perhaps you have a comment about that. And um, someone was asking if there are interventions to reverse health effects of air pollution. So I would, so I'm, I'm throwing them out together because maybe you can sort of 
look at that as a yeah kind of one. Yeah, so uh, gas stoves do increase uh, your PM 2.5 levels. Uh, and and when I, I mean, I don't really mean the clean gas, the natural gas that most of us burn in our households here, but, but propane stoves, for example, definitely do. Um, what was the second part of the question? Was um, uh, So uh, about whether uh, there are interventions that we can do to reverse the health effects of air pollution. Yeah. Right. So, um, right. So I, there appear to be um, interventions that reverse atherosclerosis in general. So in some people taking a statin, for example, and really getting your cholesterol levels as low as possible have, have been shown to, to shrink back those plaques um, or help those plaques turn from the kind that rupture into a kind that's calcified and less likely to rupture. It's no guarantee that you're someone who's going to respond to that type of therapy. Um, for most people, I think what we're hoping for is just to halt any further progression, which we're getting pretty good at doing with medication and preventing these, these kinds of environmental exposures. Um, but uh, I think, you know, we should work with your doctor to do whatever you can to decrease your risk profile. And if you get it low enough, you may see some regression of that burden of atherosclerosis. Got it. Um, so just to clarify your response about the, the gas stove, you were talking about more propane, you said, versus natural gas. Is that the yeah, distinction to, that you were making? Right. So to my knowledge, you know, burning the gas that we burn, that we get piped into our houses here in the city, um, you know, there's very mild elevations in harmful pollutants in your kitchen from, from burning that. You probably would have much higher levels actually if you burn your bacon or whatever you're cooking. You know, um, just that amount of smoke um, can 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 be harmful. Um, so I'd recommend ventilating it if you're cooking something that's smoky. But the combustion of the gas itself at very high temperatures is, is pretty clean. There's that that type of natural gas is not the type of gas that's used in a lot of places in the world. They rely more on on um, contaminated gases, propane, et cetera. And that has shown a strong association with uh, pollution exposures and, and cardiovascular disease to the point that a lot of these, a lot of lower and middle income countries and the programs they have to reduce household air pollution are trying to provide clean burning stoves um, rather than unclean gas or solid fuel stoves. Got it. Um, okay. And then someone was asking if how you would counsel people who are cyclists in terms of their exposures? Great question. Um, and, uh, and this is an area of really, you know, of debate right now, because there's a risk benefit. There's a benefit of exercising outdoors, but what's the risk of being exposed? So right now, the community is kind of aligned on this concentration of 100 being the cutoff, where the harms of exercising outdoors um, outweigh the benefits of exercise. So if, if your PM 2.5 level outside is 100 or higher, or in particular, if, you're, if you have pre-existing heart disease, it, I would recommend exercising indoors. You know, find a gym, walk around a mall, et cetera. And of course, it's, it's gonna be a continuum. There's not a hard cutoff, but, but as the levels increase, there's a transition from benefit to risk. Okay. Um... The, um, so what are um, some of the things that um, you are most excited about when you think about, you know, the next five or 10 years? I know you've already talked a little bit about, you know, some of the things that are going on now, what you anticipate, but I don't know if there are additional things that you can add to that looking a little further down the road. Yeah, I think. In the next five to 10 years, you know, we've got, we've got a few trials right now. There's probably a dozen globally that are testing these interventions like face masks, like uh, household um, air cleaners, even cardioprotective medications that reduce inflammation um, are all being tested um, in randomized trials, looking at hard endpoints, of cardiovascular disease. And we're going to start seeing the results come out soon. And what I'm excited about is what, that's going to mean for clinical practice, because once there's evidence that 
this these interventions save lives. Then you get it in the guidelines of the medical societies. Then it becomes important to be part of clinical practice. Then you get insurance providers at least being under pressure to reimburse for things like face masks or household air pollution systems, et cetera. And I think, I think it's the first step in bringing the environment into the clinic. You know, air pollution is, has the most evidence among the different environmental risk factors for, for heart disease. But once we bring air pollution in, you know, but that scaffolding is there to bring in other risk factors like heavy metals, et cetera, the other things that we've talked about. Um, and uh, I think that that is, leads us to this endpoint of a really a comprehensive view of health. We're not just focused on the individual, but we're focused on the, the individual and the environment. Okay. Um, in terms of, um, you know, again, you know, some of these things have, have been addressed to a degree, but is there anything else that you would add about um, community-wide health interventions? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, then you get into, you know, policy, things like that, to reduce risk or, or protect cardiovascular health? Yeah. Um, I think it's easy as a doctor to talk about the individual doctor-patient interventions, but historically, it's really the community-wide interventions that have made the biggest difference. It's the government-level regulations that have cut emissions, for example, that have really made the difference, both in terms of health and in terms of economic impact. Um, like the, clean, the U.S. Clean Air Act from decades ago is estimated to have about a 30 times return on the economic gains from improved productivity and decreased you know, poor, health, poor health outcomes. So these, these um, government-level regulations are very important. We're pretty good in the U.S. We're not as good as some other countries um, across the Atlantic, but we're certainly better than a lot of these low- and middle-income countries that have a long way to go. Um, other things that need, I think, need to be done, you know, there's, you look at, at smoking, um, mass media campaigns have been very effective there and educating the public, empowering people to take this issue into their own hands and protect themselves. I think that's an important step. Um, and even health systems like ours, I think, can start to outreach into the communities, into vulnerable subpopulations um, with education, with, with intervention. Okay, um, so we're pretty much winding down. I don't know if anybody else has anything else to add, but if you have any sort of less things that you would like to add about, you know, what people can do, um, you know, in their day-to-day -day lives that you haven't already mentioned. I know you mentioned, you know, a number of things, um, you know. Um, yeah, I think... I think um, the first step is just awareness. So I would you know, encourage everybody, it's very easy to just get a daily update on your air pollution exposures. You can ask Alexa to do it for you. You can have your iPhone send you an alert um, and just be conscious. And you'll see it's just a matter of time until that smoke from California travels over here and we're really at an unhealthy level. And I don't think you want to be trying to figure out what to do the day that happens. You know, when next fire season, next summer, think about what you would, if you're someone particularly at high risk, think about how you would plan your day for a few days that were really smoky. Maybe you should stock up on toilet paper and prescription medications and things so you don't have to go outside. Maybe you want to have a face mask, you know, around that, that you can, you know, in your car or something that you can wear. Um, I think just those first steps of awareness, um, are, are important. If you're someone who's really at risk and really, you know, spends a lot of time in an area with really high pollution, then you need to think more about ensuring that you have a clean air space indoors and that you're filtering your, your indoor air. Right. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, so much great uh, and exciting information. Um, it's, it's terrific research and um, a lot of, a lot of great tips for all of us. And um, so thank you for that. And before we close, we'd love to ask the audience to complete an evaluation that is in the link in the chat. Um, and um, I think you will, uh, I don't know whether you'll receive it, you know, after the, after this, this session, but um, please, you know, it would be great to, to provide your evaluation. Um, I hope that you will join us next Wednesday for a talk with Dr. Ryan Walker about nutrition and gut microbiome, another very important topic. 
um, and just look for, um, you know, register for the full series of the webinar so you can take advantage of uh, some of this amazing research. And um, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.